Welcome, gentle listener. I am Baldemort, your faithful servant, and I wish to introduce you to the forces, factions, and faces of the Warhammer 40k setting, the grim darkness of the far future, where there is no time for peace. There is only time for war. Now, if you like what I do, then hit me up with a like and subscribe, a conversational or observational comment if you have the time. And check out our other channel, Living Mythology, if you like a good yarn. It's good stuff, we're told. Now, today, we are to discuss a species of the setting that is an amalgamation of existing tropes, yet so much more than the sum of these disparate parts. They end up being one of the most interesting elements of the setting, when one chooses to shine a light upon them. With gorgeous new models and a wealth of character, they are a firm favourite of some of the most discerning in the community. Of course. I can only be speaking of the allies and defenders of the diminutive Tau. The Kroot. Now I have to admit that the Kroot and the Tower entire are not my strongest suit, so I shall be quoting extensively from the new Codex, then adding my own thoughts at the conclusion. Ah, the Kroot. What a fabulous set of nasties they are. With distinctive culture, silhouette, and position, they are the bulwark and the beatstick of the glorious Tau Fire cast. Allies that are deadly and fulfill a role that the smaller Tau cannot historically manage. But let us truly hear what they are about. Coming from the very newest Tau Codex for 10th edition, let us hear a bit of a story. To quote... The pack of young Krutoks leapt and swung between the branches. Great, sm great strength, formidable grip, and long evolved dexterity saw them weave between the limbs of the trees in such a way that barely disturbed the leaves. Toet Orak rolled with the movements of his Krutoks, Breck, his joints loose though his hold on the creature's harness was strong. A series of long, low whistles came from ahead. It was Koret Ka the trail shaper. To virtually any creature that might have heard them, the shaper's sounds would have been unidentifiable as anything bar the wind. But Dreat Orak knew what they meant, prey moving in an armoured column. Both his and Breck's quills rustled in anticipation. Lord Vakar had no idea what came for them. Dreat and his mount were not alone. Krachar and the Krutoks, Yerav, Tobokyor and Vrat, and Okgur and Elb, too, were bounding and diving through the woodland with them. The density of the trees made little difference to the massive Krutoks. For all their slabs of muscle, thick jaws, and rock-crushing claws, they moved with grace and agility. Light poured through the canopy above, dappling over the Krut and Krutoks' moss-coloured skin, breaking their forms and rendering them barely visible in their silent movements. There was another whistle. Dayette hooted back. We are coming. The whistle that followed was sharper. Slowly, they are close. As the Kroot heard the trail shaper's warning, the pace of the Krutoks fell, and they dropped without sound to the forest floor. Their movements through the underbrush became more deliberate. Good, thought Dayette rubbing his mount's head gently. Dread could see the forest brighten ahead. The canopy was standing out. They were near the edge of the tree line. Breck slowed to a creeping stalk, his quills rigid. Those of Dread were the same, and he flicked his tongue in and out of his beaked mouth, tasting the air. The last of the trees petered out to a rolling plain of grass. The thin, swaying blades towered over Dread's head, the Ortovacar vehicles were out of sight, hundreds of leaps away. The Coot could already feel the tremor of their approach, smell the thick scent of polluting smog they emitted, and hear the higher-pitched rolling and clunking of four separate sets of tracks on each vehicle. He could tell that there were six of them, cutting a path between the hillocks of the plains. With a terse blast of clicks, Dreyat told the Coot to move up to a rise to the right of their position. He wanted the vantage point. The four Krutoks moved in unison. It would have been easy for them to just barrel straight through the grass, but they knew better than to do this. It would just reveal their position. Instead, they snaked through, 
following a contour around the base of the hillock, and only moving to its peak in the same direction as the wind, so their disturbing of the grass was much less obvious. At the top, Dreyette stood at full height on Breck's back for a moment, to catch a glimpse of the rumbling column of box-like Otvakar vehicles. The Torox were dark green with orange stripes. He did not need to see them to attack. Their smell and noise were more than enough to know their location, but there was something primal, instinctive, about seeing prey with the naked eye. The coot around him clicked rapidly and whistled. The Kutox scraped the ground and huffed. They were eager to attack. It was a feeling Dre had shared. He whipped his tongue again. The air was dry and warm. He could smell the sweat and flesh of the soldiers inside the vehicles and hear their hearts beat. He salivated, emitting a high-pitched whistle in his desire to kill and feast. The crew around him did the same. Soon, a series of warbling clicks echoed from the plains to the north. Stop. Soon we will feed, but when the time is ripe. It was Koretka. She would not have the Krut and Krutok strike too soon. Several hooted in frustrated acquiescence. Within minutes, Dreyat tasted new scents and his quill shivered. More Krut. Kalex pack. And their Krutox were approaching from the prey's other flank. Breck grunted and clawed at the ground while the Krut waited for Koretka to release them. Dreyath soothed his mount with soft coos, even as he bit his own tongue to stop himself from shrieking his bloodlust and urging Breck into a charge. He knew they had to wait until the Ortvakar were close, so that they wouldn't have time to train their guns on the Krut. But the wait took all his strength. Finally, a loud whistle signaled the attack. As one, the encircled Krut packs howled and screeched. Breck roared and took off towards the Ortvakar, his immense fists pounding the ground. Dread raised his long cleaver, saliva dripping from his beak, blood pumping through his muscles. The Krutox parted the long grass like a cleaver splitting rotting meat. Every step of their rolling movements thumped the ground. Dreyat ducked low behind Breck's head to avoid the whip-like grass blades, his joints moving like gyroscopes to ensure his stability as the Kutox charged. The sound of snapping stalks filled his ear cavities. The grass grew shorter as the crude bore down upon the vehicles. Dreyat wheeled Breck to the first in the column. Slow that one, he thought, and the rest will be slowed in turn. He drew a long javelin, its point sharpened to a razor's edge. The coot had achieved such surprise that the vehicle hadn't even had time to fire their guns before Drehet was upon them. Greg thumped along beside the lead vehicle, powered ahead, and lunged across in front of it. Dread threw his javelin through one of the vehicle's viewing slits with a well-practiced aim. The movement was a quick snap, powered by wiry musculature. The point penetrated the slit's thick grass, plunging into the luckless driver behind. The vehicle swerved. Breck hadn't slowed, and now weaved behind the lead torox into the path of the second. By now, the Ortvakar had responded to the crude attack, and the chug of automatic weapons fire was added to the rumble of tracks and the crude's ululating hunting cries. Dreyat could see the constant movements of his pack all around as they attempted to isolate the Ortvakar vehicles. As Brick pounded past the second vehicle, Dreyat leapt off the Krutox onto the Torox. In a split second, he identified a hatch and activated a quill grenade, multiple needle points projecting millimeters out from its round surface, ready to be unleashed upon the moment of detonation. In another second, Dreyat had torn open the hatch with a fierce yank and tossed the quill grenade inside. He ran to the rear of the Torox and leapt. Landing on Breck's back as the Kutok thundered past the human vehicle, his nimble hands and feet easily finding his harness's hold. Dreyat knew his grenade had detonated when the Torox veered wildly. The scent of blood reached him and he drooled. Hundreds of needles would have shredded those inside. The vehicle's now chaotic path took it over a bump in the ground ahead, causing it to lean perilously onto its portside tracks. With perfect timing, Krachar 
Dark Gur and their Krutoks slammed into its flank. Dreyat saw the Krutox's immense arms flex and tense as they pushed against the Torox, whose tracks span helplessly in thin air. The Krutox pushed hard, clawed feet driving into the ground. They toppled the vehicle onto its side with a harsh metallic crunch and ground-shaking thud. Dreyat and Breck looped around the overturned Torox as they came behind it. Its rear hatch squealed open and a dazed and bloodied soldier stumbled out, helmed and wearing plate armor the same color as the vehicle. They carried a long, scoped weapon with cables running into their backpack. Breck picked up speed instinctively, charging towards them. Dreyat howled in bloodlust and swung his cleaver into the soldier's neck. Metal ripped through flesh, tendon, and bone. The soldier's head tumbled away into the grass, and their body dropped, hot blood fountaining from their stump of a neck and causing Dreyat to salivate with anticipation. More soldiers emerged, and they were pounced upon by the other crew and torn apart. Bodily parts flying as blood-curdling screams added to the cacophony of battle. Bones cracked, and limbs left their sockets with wet pops. Other soldiers emerged from the remaining two vehicles, firing streams of laser blasts and shouting. Dread screeched as his flesh was seared by near miss. Next to him, a Kutox from the other pack took several hits to her face. She reared, howling in pain, before crashing to the ground. He saw the soldier who killed her. With her back to a vehicle, now trying to hit Kabotkyo, Dreyat's packmate was moving too fast, the soldier unable to get a bead. All yours, Breck, Dreyat urged. The Krutox surged towards the auto of a car. Within seconds, all that remained of her was a pile of torn limbs and pulverized meat in a pool of steaming blood. Around Dreyat, the sounds of battle were quietening. He heard a thump and squelch as a javelin pierced the back of a fleeing soldier and smelled the blood exploding from their chest as a weapon's point burst through. He also smelled the bowels of another soldier empty just before the Krutox ripped them in half at the waist. He saw their organs slop to the ground as the creature held up the soldier's upper half and took a bite out of their head. Dreyat came to the headless corpse of the soldier he'd killed, stepping from Breck's back onto the flattened grass. He picked up their weapon, turning it over in his hands. He heard a series of terse clicks and looked up. There was Karotka, holding a Kroot rifle in the crook of her arm, its barrel still smoking from recent firing. No weapons. You know the Tau forbid it, Karotka reminded, clicking her beak-like mouth, Dayat whistled in frustration, hands still clenched around the weapon. They say nothing of the flesh, he said. They do not, said Koretka. Dayat broke the hand's fingers, ripping them off and throwing them into his mouth. He crunched the bones and felt the blood trickle down his throat. He dropped to the ground and drove his beak and claws into the soldier's guts. Around him, he heard the guzzling, chewing, and tearing as the others fed. The Warriors of Peck The Crute The Crute are by far the most common alien auxiliaries serving in the Firecast armies. With many billions of their kind armed for war and assigned to hunter cadres of nearly every sept, Although their primitive aggression is viewed with distaste by the Tau, such inherent savagery makes them particularly effective shock troops. The Tau and the Crude have long enjoyed a mutually beneficial alliance, dating back to the First Sphere expansion. A Tau exploration fleet encountered a fierce battle between the brutish orcs and another species, which they later learned was the Crude who they saw possessed a tenacious and hardy spirit. Compelled to aid the Kroot, the Tau went on to fight beside them for many years, eventually freeing the avian species' enclaves. This conflict became known as the War in the Place of Union, and it ended upon the Kroot world of Peck. In its wake, the Kroot pledged to fight for the greater good in exchange for regular payment. The Crute at War Compared to the Tau, 
Crude are warlike and bloodthirsty, yet they are neither stupid nor bestial. The Crude are uncommonly skilled trackers, infiltrators and wilderness fighters, experts in fieldcraft who swiftly master the perils and boons of each new ecosystem they encounter. When fighting for the Tau, the Crude act as scouts, ambushers, skirmish screens and counter-offensive close combat reserves. Their speed, survival skills, and natural ferocity are all traits the Tau lack in comparison and, as in the case of hand-to-hand -hand combat, have no desire to develop. The Groot give Tau commanders even greater flexibility in both Kaon and Montcar strategies. The avian allies are naturally suited to the role of the patient hunter and can operate in terrain difficult even for pathfinders or stealth teams. For those commanders who favor Montcar, the Krut are superb terror troops who can storm enemy lines from hidden positions and pave the way for the rest of the Tau army. When fighting independently, Krut war packs operate primarily as guerrilla forces. They melt away into the densest terrain after whittling their enemies down with repeated rifle volleys. In this way, they can outlast and outwit most foes. This does not mean that the Kroot are incapable of delivering furious attacks, however. Their onslaughts are terrifying to behold. They leap into the fight while voicing shrill avian cries. Blades at each end of their rifles allow them to hack and slash at their foes. The most skillful, spinning these weapons like blurring quarterstaves. Yet the Kroot possess natural weapons also, in the form of talons and beak-like maws lined with sharp fangs. They have no qualms about using these to rip their enemies to bloody tatters. On unnumbered battlefields, the Kroot have been witnessed rabidly consuming the flesh of their foes in a savage feeding frenzy. Sometimes, their enemies have yet to die when the Kroot rip their flesh, break off their limbs, or tear into their necks. Physiology Kroot are tall, wiry, and possess a light, almost hollow bone structure. This gives the appearance of physical frailty, though this is far from the truth. Their muscles are composed of dense fiber spindles with a greater power to mass ratio than those possessed by humans. Due to this, they move in a quick bounding gait and have the power to leap considerable heights and distances. Perhaps the Kroot's most notable feature are their crowns of elongated, flexible quills. These are powerful sensory organs, which, combined with the Kroot's extremely strong senses of smell and eyesight, help make them formidable trackers and pack hunters. Their natural affinity for hunting and a life exposed to the elements are contributed to further by the way they generate waste. They secrete an oily sweat that serves as insulation and an antibiotic salve as well as giving the Kroot the ability to leave pheromone trails, mark territories and communicate with each other in silence. The pheromones can even be used to communicate with their subspecies, the strands. The Kroot possess a unique morphagic biology that allows them to actively absorb the desirable genetic traits from flesh they devour, which they call the strands. Being ferociously carnivorous creatures with a voracious appetite, the Kroot will gladly consume the flesh of creatures from virtually any species, though they avoid that of tyranids or beings corrupted by the warp. As a result of this evolutionary talent, there exist in the galaxy Kroot who can spit acid, have developed chameleonic abilities, or have grown oversized muscles, longer limbs, and even swimming fins. The ability to take on select genetic traits of other species is a powerful boon to the Kroot, but it is also one that comes at great risk. Without careful attention to which strands they absorb, Kroot packs and kindreds can trap themselves in an evolutionary dead end. There are numerous examples of Kroot subspecies believed to be examples of this, including the diminutive Kroot worm, skittering twelve-legged, vicious Kroot hound, a massive, great Narlock. Subspecies of the Kroot It is thought that the Kroot ancestors of each subspecies pursued certain strands so relentlessly and regularly that, while gaining numerous physical traits, 
They lost much of their intelligence as well as the ability to evolve with new strands. Their bodies and the abilities they came to possess were fixed forevermore. Though attitudes towards these creatures varies between crude kindreds, generally the crude hold them in high regard. To varying degrees, crude see these beasts as living warnings as to what might happen if they fail to carefully manage the strands they take in, as crude who cannot adapt with new strands are vulnerable. Some see the subspecies as having performed an act of self-sacrifice, first in showing the danger so clearly, and secondly, because as a result, they possess abilities which the Kut lack and can make use of to continue surviving and thriving. Most Kut also share close bond with their subspecies, with partnerships more of kinship and collaboration rather than one of dominance and domestication. The subspecies are incapable of speaking the crude language, but the whistles, hoots, and coos of the crude register in their minds nonetheless. As a result, they are able to interpret complex instructions even if they cannot reply or discuss them. Just like crude, the subspecies can also interpret the oily, sweat-like secretions the crude make, further gelling relations between the two and making the link between the crude's will and action in battles frictionless. Crude hounds, for example, are bad-tempered beasts, whose keen senses aid them in tracking down prey, and whose beast-like moors can tear through flak-weave armor with ease. The crude often release these creatures in hunting packs to maul vulnerable or fleeing foes. For all the hounds' ferocity, the crude can always rely on their swift obedience to command. Another subspecies commonly found alongside crude troops is the crutox a broad-backed creature with enormously powerful forelimbs. Their temperament varies greatly depending on their age. Older Krutox are lumbering, hulking creatures that serve as mobile heavy weapons platforms. They mount such guns as the Repeater Cannon or Krut Heavy Grenade Launcher, which is operated by a Krut warrior who has climbed onto the Krutox's large haunches. Although not aggressive as a rule, a Krutox will fight ferociously to defend its rider, whom the beast sees as a herd sibling. In comparison, younger Krutox are much more agile and hot-tempered, though are no less devoted to their rider and their kin. Together, they form rampager packs, dexterous, formidably strong, and possessing a speed that belies their sheer bulk. They form a vital component of a Krut kindred's ambushing strength, they are no less able to weave through tree branches or clamber over ruined structures than Crute, and their senses are equally strong. When the shapers command, the rampages burst from cover and charge. Some plough headlong into enemy lines, their fury scattering the foe, while Crute riders hack them down with furious cleaver blades. Other packs perform a harrying role, rooting out foes in cover, as riders throw javelin after javelin at them. Rampagers excel at disrupting enemy positions and identifying targets for the mass firepower of their Tau allies. Beyond the deep, natural bonds that crude share with their kin beasts, they also possess an instinctive affinity for the taming of non crude animals and forming strong connections with them. These can range from colonies of parasites a crude may cultivate upon their bodies to act as pets or food, all the way to gargantuan beasts. Over the millennia, the Kut have harnessed the abilities of countless creatures on unnumbered worlds, one that has formed a mainstay for Kut kindreds and has also been deployed alongside Tau hunter cadres is a Calamandra, an amphibian-esque quadruped native to the swamps of Chata. These creatures, which are incredible climbers, have lightning-fast reactions are capable of moving at high speed and possess chameleonic properties. This, combined with the Calamandra's solitary nature, make them perfect mounts for crude lone spears. These are trackers and observers who operate far from their employers, allies, and fellow crude. Though many lone spears prefer the solitude of such a role, there are those who maintain this distance as a necessary sacrifice through devotion to the needs of their kindred. Equipped with weapons such as the Krut Long Gun or a Blast Javelin, 
they can also take advantage of the Calamandra's stealthy capabilities to lie in perfect position to swiftly knock out enemy light vehicles and rapidly scurry away. The Shapers To help avoid the evolutionary dead ends into which the subspecies have fallen, the Crute rely on the leadership of their Shapers. These are Crute who possess an instinctive understanding of their species' strange ability, the strands, and how best to exploit them. The Crute follow their Shapers with fierce loyalty. Shapers are more than genetic guides for their people. They fulfill the roles of mystic shamans, military commanders, void navigators, and much more. Some of the aptitudes required for shaping manifest naturally in certain young Crute, thus marking them for greatness. The Crute are adaptable and pragmatic people, however, able to teach and learn the required skills for various branches of shaping. They place great emphasis on ensuring they are never without these vital leaders and guides. Shaping as a discipline is a broad tree, with many branches that each concern a different specialism valuable to crude society. Trail shaping, for example, is the mastery of marking paths for crude in ways others could not detect, killing sentries, making river crossings, and triggering avalanches to remove enemy observation posts or close off routes to their forces. War shaping, meanwhile, involves the formulation of battle strategy, the coordination of packs, and selecting the time and place of attack and withdrawal. Flesh shapers are those most notable in the arts of flesh shaping, selecting the strands their kin should devour. Though all shapers are expected to perform the duties associated with any branch, most have preferences or talents which result in them spending much of their lives serving in a single capacity and becoming known by their primary branch as trail shapers, war shapers, flesh shapers, and so on. The Crute have been a mercenary species for as long as they have traversed the stars, trading their fighting skills and natural ferocity for weapons, food, and other resources. Thus, another important duty of the shapers is to follow the branch of pact shaping, seeking out mercenary employment for their kindred and setting the terms of each contract. Many of these arrangements are formed with the Tau, but by no means all of them. Crute have little compunction as to their employers. Their strange and colossal void-faring war spheres ply the space lanes far and wide, and they have been seen fighting for human inquisitors and rogue traders, alongside Eldari of various sorts, in allegiance with kin of the leagues of Votan, and on behalf of even stranger and more shadowy employers, that have been known to include agents of chaos. There is no telling exactly how Crute might choose those they fight for. Any might have personal, genetic, or circumstantial reasons to reject or align themselves with those of another of the galaxy species. Ultimately, the ideal mercenary role for the Crute is one that comes with ample payment, low risk of death, and the opportunity to secure new strands for their people. The Crute are a wily species, which combined with millennia of experience and the Shaper's instinctive talents, makes them superb mercenary contract negotiators. But it is not just these factors that give them an edge. Often, a kindred would have consumed examples of a species they are in talks with, giving them a unique insight into their fears, strengths, and desires. They are ever wary of would-be employers assigning them suicidally dangerous missions in the hopes of never having to pay the Crute for their mercenary services. Crute mitigate such risks with careful negotiation, secret plans, and a willingness to abandon an employer without remorse. It is not unheard of for Crute to switch sides mid-battle on the promise of greater rewards or to better ensure their survival. The only exception made by the Crute to this amoral position is in their dealings with the Tau, to whom they remain unfalteringly loyal. Though they find it all but impossible not to look down upon the Crute's apparently rustic ways, or to be repulsed by the aliens bloody gorging on the foe, the Tau treat the Crute with great respect. Furthermore, the Crute have never forgotten the aid the Tau gave them so long ago, and it is returned in kind. Though many Crute will serve as mercenaries at some point, 
For some, it becomes a significant portion of their lives, or the definition of them. Such is the case with the Far Stalker Kim bands, close-knit veterans who have often spent years away from Peck, the surrounding crude enclaves, and the wider Tao Empire. They are known for their independent-mindedness, wide use of alien weapons and technology, and fieldcraft skills superb even for their own kind. The Peck System Though no world holds as great a significance to the Crute as their nest world of Peck, they have settled every planet in their home system, as well as many beyond its bounds. Kror is a petrified forest world saturated with radiation. Its wildlife is hideously mutated, and it is forbidden to eat anything from there. Only Crute granted specials permission by the Shapers may travel to it. In comparison, Paul Locke is a verdant world, its population second only to Peck in size. Where Peck's native species have been all but wiped out by the Crute for food, leaving much lower genetic diversity, strict discipline on the part of Paul Locke's flesh shapers has maintained the planet's breadth of creatures. The third largest Crute population lives on the jungle world of Charta. Orcoid space hulk wreckage litters the surface, and the population is split between extreme traditionalists who shun Charter's technological bounties and dwell deep in the world's many swamps, and the techno-savvy who have exploited the debris scattered over their planet. On the frozen forest world of Aqua, life for the Crute is hard, and so they view the Crute of the other worlds as soft. Their planet is heavily polluted, rich in harsh fuel chemicals, which the Coot work tirelessly to tap for their own needs with little care for Aqua itself. The entirely artificial planetoid of Noko Miss was not created by the Crude. Earth cast scientists have solved few of its mysteries. It has become a bustling spaceport all the same, home to an ever changing population of traders, mercenaries, and travelers, drawn from scores of alien species, especially those belonging to the Tao Empire. Crude society. Crude live in kindreds, gathering somewhere between mercenary companies, extended tribal families, and nomadic warbands, which can range greatly in size. Each has its own codes, traditions, and scent variants, as well as skin pigmentation. Besides external attack, the greatest threat of a kindred is evolutionary stagnation, and so they constantly strive for continued growth and survival. Success in war and trade are essential for the acquiring of new strands. Bonds within a kindred are extremely close. Each crude is known by their scent, the sounds of their steps, the way their quills rattle when they smell fresh blood, as well as their squawks and howls. To attack one crude is to raise the ire of its entire kindred. The crude greatly revere their ancestors, known collectively as the Roots. These forebears husbanded the wisdom, knowledge, and strands that enabled the crude of the present to live and continue their, their family lines. In stark contrast to this grounded ancestor worship and the way in which the crude care deeply for their own, when it comes to survival of the kindred, the crude follow a grimly practical approach. A long history of wandering and wilderness survival on their arboreal homeworld of Peck has engendered in them a pragmatism that to the Tao seems extremely cruel. In times of war, famine, or other events that might focus them to move quickly, they will eat their old, young, and infirm, who might otherwise slow them down. In so doing, they preserve their strands for the future. Those killed in this way are seen to have made a sacrifice for their kindred for, as is the nature of the crude, the needs of the people come first. The Homeworld The Crude evolved on their nest world's warm and temperate primary continent. It is a place of steaming jungles, enormous forests, towering mountains and abundant wildlife. Here there are many places of great cultural significance to the Crude, sites of great and somber gravitas that seem almost to flow from the wider hall of the natural world around them. The enormous carved Jaga tree on the slopes of Mount Kikaun, where Angkor Prok was laid to rest. The grove of the ancestors in the Kamyon Mountains. The Oathstone on the Plain of Bones, 
where Proc pledged his people's allegiance to the Tau. There are also places the could avoid, one being the Yoglath Forest, in which the trees are twisted and black, and terrifying monsters distantly related to the Kroot dwell. The Kroot's nest world has an immense hold over them. Even those born far away from it feel an intense pull to migrate to Peck at some point in their lives. This has proven to be an evolutionary boon for the Kroot, as kindreds answering the instinctive call home bring with them new strands to continually rejuvenate their genetic breath. End quote. Seems brief, but a good overview, no? Well, let us now look at the very origin of the Kroot, and why not go to the most ancient of all their legends, taken from the Liber Xenologist, the Battle of Nothing Sea. Kroot Mythology The Battle of Nothing Sea The Battle of Nothing Sea was a battle between the gods Vork the Huntress and Gamork the Destroyer, which the Kroot believed created the universe. According to the Kroot, Vork existed before the dawn of the cosmos and wandered alone in the emptiness of space known as the Nothing Sea. As she flew, Vork spent her time devising what she called the Great Plan, which would cause the birth of the heavens and bring life to the cosmos. However, after countless ages of traveling, Vork met another god named Gamork the Destroyer in the Nothing Sea. After being alone for so long, Vork was delighted to meet another god and approached Gamork with an offer of friendship. She suggested to Gamork that they should work together to discover other gods, but the Destroyer laughed at this idea and attacked her instead. Thus began the Battle of Nothing Sea, and the god's blows were so powerful that Nothing Sea began to tear and the stars began to be born. Gamork enjoyed their fight so much that he did not notice this, but the wise of Vork did and took advantage of his ignorance. The goddess began steering the destroyer in different directions and used his vigor to spread the birth of the heavens in accordance with her great plan. Even then, Vork tried to stop the battle twelve times by asking Gamork to see sense, but each time the destroyer refused. As that battle continued, pieces of the stars were broken off and became worlds, which caused Vork to see that the galaxy was now beautiful. The goddess reveled in the glory of her great plan, but Gamork then finally noticed the changes they had wrought. Vork's joy turned to despair as Gamork sought to destroy everything she had made, and the goddess strived to defeat him. They had been evenly matched throughout the battle, though, and neither could best their opponent. Where Gamork was strong, Vork was fast. Where Gamork was steadfast, Vork was agile. Finally, Vork succumbed to a great rage and plunged her beak into Gamork's neck. The destroyer god's blood filled her gullet, but she was so repulsed by its flavor that she immediately spat it out. However, one drop managed to slip down her throat, and Vork suddenly felt a great sickness begin to spread throughout her body. She also found that she now had the same strength as Gamork, which was now outmatched by the goddess, and he was defeated. Afterwards, Vork banished her foe to the regions of the Nothing Sea, that had yet to be rescued from darkness by the heaven's birth. The sickness in Vork began to spread fast, and the goddess realized that Gamork's god blood had fatally poisoned her. With her life coming to an end, Vork singled out the world right at the center of the great plan, called Peck, and landed on its surface. The goddess then spread her wings across the world's land, forming mountains from her bones and forests from her feathers. Before Vork died from the god blood poison, she used her final breath to vomit out a great flock of eagles into the sky, which gave rise to the Kroot. Now this tale harkens back to their earliest days, but there are some glaringly obvious hints as to their history, 
to be taken from this legend. The Kroot have a very impressive ability that marks them as distinctive from most of the races in the Milky Way galaxy, and that is a certain level of genetic plasticity, one might say, for there are elements within their helixes that are not entirely fixed and can merge or absorb the strands of others as we have heard. So in this way, we can make an educated guess about the meaning of this battle of the Nothing Sea when we compare and contrast it with what is actually known of the race. For many have pointed to the seeming simplicity of the culture and technology of the Crute, and then been flabbergasted by their deployment of interplanetary spaceships called War Spheres, a sight that has been seen across every region of the galaxy, according to old lore. I believe they are more contained in the eastern fringe in the newest versions. On Peck itself, there are signs of an industrial civilization that has long been destroyed. And so, we add the details together to come up with something of a chronology. The Kroot evolved on Peck, but then encountered the Orcs, clearly shown by the god Gamork in the tale. And it is here that they must have consumed some of the strands from the Orcs themselves, then defeated them. Probably a crash landing on Peck by Orcs, perhaps a rather smaller war than that of the kind seen in the modern era, as the Groot adapted and defeated the Orcs. And in this way, we can see how they would have become technologically advanced enough to create starships, as the creation of these vessels are built into the Orcs on a genetic level. And the Groot operate on a similar paradigm, where they intrinsically know how to create some objects of incredibly advanced technology, while having absolutely no concept of how they actually work. It's not as if the crew have massive universities for the development of tech. Nothing could be further from the truth. Yet, some say that this is a decision unto itself, but we should get to that. Now, the tale of the Nothing Sea shows that the universe was created, of course, but also that the Greenskins, in the form of Gamork, came and destroyed much of what Vork had brought, and in this, we can guess the nature of the old civilizations there on Peck. For many believe that the Crute did indeed develop, but that they must have been struck by another much larger and more deadly Orc invasion, one that brought their world to its knees, and also a cycle that repeats itself again and again, as it should. For the Orcs are ubiquitous in the galaxy, and have been a near perpetual thorn in the side of the region in which the Crute and Tau live, the Eastern Fringe. Hence it is believed by many that the Orcs returned to Peck and leveled it. Yet, the Crute won out again, but they may have had a cultural aversion to advanced technology, blaming it somehow for the calling of the Orcs, or at least marking them as a target worthy of being assaulted by a green-skin war. This cycle was repeated when the Crute took to the stars in war spheres and formed a modest empire the Orcs attacked yet again, this time near wiping out the entire race. The Beleg, the Orcs, smashed every single ship they came across, following them back to the Kroot worlds and slaughtering every Kroot there. In the end, the Kroot were fighting their last stand on Peck when the noble Tau not only witnessed their battle, but then intervened. Thus, the Kroot remember that their race exists, but for the mercy and brotherhood of the Tau. And so, they fight for the Tau with as much furore and valor as ever the fanatics of the Imperium do for their lords. And it is the Crute who are some of the most important elements in the auxiliary armies of the Tau. For the Crute are built for the one place that the Tau do not excel, close quarters melee. It has been many a force of the greater good that would have been trodden underfoot by orcs, marines, or guard that was victorious due to the courage and aggression of the Crude. Now, we've mentioned them often, so let's see what they are all about. The War Sphere A War Sphere is a powerful Crude starship, the last vestige of the ancient power and surprising scientific advancement of the Crude civilization prior to its move away from advanced technology. A War Sphere is effectively a flying town comprising a central section connecting the sphere that serves to house the main warp engine and maneuvering thrusters. While the war sphere's drives and thrusters are very reliable, 
they also possess poor power output. This means that war spheres are extremely slow when moving through real space, though they are sufficiently powerful to enable planetary landings, an unusual feature for a void ship this large. Speaking of which, the void shield is generally comparable to any other race's battleship and is approximately 9 kilometers in diameter, weighing in at approximately 47 megatons and having an approximate crew of over 300,000 crewed. On the surface of a world, the thrusters are often fired once more to bury the war sphere, presumably to enable it to revert to its role as a traditional crewed town. War spheres are fairly rare, and so will only be deployed in the case that the crewed are gaining a substantial payment or bonus from their employer, whether this be their traditional allies, the Tau, or another employer who has contracted for their mercenary services. To travel at faster than light speeds across interstellar distances, the crewed make use of warp drives. Unlike the Tau, who have not mastered the technology, the how crewed warp drives function remains a mystery even to the Tau since the crew have no navigators to make passage through the Empyrean safe and reliable. Instead, the crew appear to have a natural affinity for navigating towards an inhabitable planet, almost as if they were possessed of a sixth sense, though they are not known to be a psychic species. The warsphere is a gigantic structure, easily the length of a battleship. Each encompasses a volume greater than many space stations, their axial plasma drive alone is larger than that of many other warships, blazing with the might of several suns to move the massive bulk of the warspheres through space. While slow and ponderous, extensive and powerful maneuvering thrusters allow them to change facing more easily than most void ships. Despite the name, warspheres are more than warships. Each is the home for many crude kindred, each long separated from their distant home system and not wishing to see their new one destroyed. When they do need to fight, though, they are dangerous opponents. Each ship is covered with macro batteries and can launch numerous assault craft loaded with fierce crude carnivore squads. Boarding or ramming a war sphere is unadvisable due to the sheer numbers of the furious defenders as well. The larger ones often carry many valuables, though, and are sometimes the target of massed pirate fleets. In combat, war spheres are somewhat unconcerned with maneuvering, War spheres primarily fight defensively, and they're trying to break through a blockade to invade a planet, and usually flee if any serious danger of being overwhelmed. End quote. And so I hope you feel that you now have a much better understanding of the Kroot. Of course, there are always details which I have to leave out for brevity. Not that this is brief, of course, but you get my meaning. Now like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video, and thank you for your precious time. Now, no matter what you do today, do try to make some time for fun. Toodaloo.